Hi, my name is Noma Langam Sali Moses, and today I am here at Your Black Women, where black women keep it real. Women from all different walks of life come in to share their views, experiences, and expertise about how we can uh, better contribute to our community. Today I'm here with Dr. Tyra Selden who is an educator, a writer, and an editor at Your Black Education. How are you doing today, Tyra? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great, and I'm excited about this topic. Um, as you know, I'm, in a, I'm a homeschool mom, and I'm always mm -hmm. uh, excited to get together with other, with other educators and hear what they have to say. Um, the segment that we're doing today is called How You Can Save Your Kids from Being Swallowed by a Racist Public School System. And so, of course, I invited Tyra to join me in this conversation um, so that we can give parents um, and educators tips and information that would help them uh, or help them help kids be successful in their education. Um, so I'll jump right in, Tyra, and let you um, start giving us a few tips and, and guidance. Okay. I'd like to start with maybe three points um, that I think are critical for parents to understand about navigating the educational system. The first point is that you have to be aware. Um, be mindful, knowledgeable in terms of your child's school. Um, how does the school perform? What are their um, test scores like? If it's a high school, what are their graduation, graduation rates right? like um, is there a high attrition rate you want to pay attention to what is the school's culture because ultimately if your child is going to be a part of that you want them to be in a culture that's going to groom them for success so if you see any red flags if your child's school is on um, what's called an AYP list which means that they did not meet the performance goals of prior year if your um, child's school is not a compliance for desegregation that's a flag if your child's school has a very low graduation rate that's a flag so you want to make sure that you know where you're sending them. So that's point one, be knowledgeable. Point two, try to build relationships with people at the school, specifically your child's teachers. Um, recently, I was at a school and a parent came to pick up his uh, daughter and we went to the front office and the uh, secretary said, well, what's your daughter's teacher's name? The father paused and he said, well, she's a third grader. And the secretary said, well, we have three third grade classes. What's the teacher's name? And it kind of struck me as odd that here it was, I think it was late October, and he didn't know his daughter's teacher's name. So they're little subtle, simple things that parents can do. Make a point of knowing who's teaching your child. Um, make sure that you go to parent-teachers conferences, to open houses. Make sure that you correspond with your teachers. Don't wait until there's something that happens. And it's not necessarily that a teacher has to be the first one to reach out to you. It's perfectly okay if you send a teacher an email or a phone call, depending on the mode of communication that they have said is best for them, to basically say, hi, I'm such and such as father, I'm such and such as mother, I'm just checking in to see how he or she is doing. And the third part I think is very, very critical that sometimes parents underestimate, and that is is that you're your child's first educator. We put a lot of emphasis on what's taking place in the classroom, what's taking place in our educational systems, and sometimes we put too much trust into those systems. And we expect those systems to produce children to that behave and act a certain way, when in turn, a lot of that needs to take place at home because your values. Um, your worldview, your belief systems will trump anything they learn in school. So the more you can instill that and instill it basically on a daily basis, I can't emphasize that enough that you're the one who's going to dictate how your child thinks about him or herself. You know, when it comes to issues of self-esteem and identity and emotional intelligence, a lot of that groundwork starts at home. So those are my three points. Um, great point, Sarah, and they go right along with a lot of things that I've said as well. Um, you have to know ahead of time, not when something happens. Um, and honestly, uh, my children are small. Right now, they're fourth grade and first grade. So if they were in the school, that means that I would be the one who has to look over their homework and see how they're progressing in school. Um, and that requires a relationship with the teacher. I'd have to have met with the teacher mm -hmm. right at the beginning. Um, and teachers do different things different ways. You want to get familiar with that teacher and their style, the frequency of homework, mm -hmm. their systems that they have in place. Um, and you don't want to be that parent like the one you mentioned. That's kind of embarrassing um, when you don't know, you know, which, which, which teacher is your child's teacher. Um, but at the same time, as parents, sometimes we get mad at the school or the administration or the teachers and be saying they're not doing their job. But at the same time, we need to do our job before we can ask anybody 
to do their job, um, which goes also to the third point that you made. Of course, this is more true for me because I'm a homeschooler, but even if your kids are in the public school system, you're their first educator, yes. And you have to look at it as this is your job and the school is helping you with your job. Whereas I find that a lot of parents think, no, it's the teacher or the school system or whatever's job to do this and they're not doing it. Well, no, it's actually the other way around. And once we take on that, that attitude or that uh, perspective of this is my job and they're helping me do my job, it actually empowers you because I feel that parents should sometimes be involved in, when they look at a curriculum and it doesn't reflect anything that they feel will add value to what their kid is learning. They should be able to say, uh, <laughs> next time we're working on curriculum, I want some input. Um, I know you're an educator and you probably don't like people stepping in on your area, but uh, as a mom, uh, I've often complained when my kids were still in school about the kind of assignments that they got. I can remember one time my kid, my daughter got an assignment and it seemed like a perfectly lovely assignment and I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, they were supposed to create a rainbow. I think she was in the first grade at the time, maybe kindergarten, but I think it was the first grade. And they were supposed to create a rainbow, but the rainbow was supposed to be based on the colors that you can find on yourself. Now, a brown kid is brown everywhere, okay? Dark brown hair, lighter brown eyes, lighter brown, you know, everything's brown. So her rainbow was brown. But other mm. little girls had blue eyes, so they could bl blue on their rainbow, golden hair, so they put yellow, their lips were pink, they put pink. Um, so their rainbows were beautiful, and her rainbow just looked like a brown <laughs> bar. And uh, again, innocently, that teacher was giving a fun exercise for the kids, um, which she, of course, didn't think through if she had considered that there's one little brown girl in the class. And it was my responsibility to send her a note and say, um, you know, again, very politely, I understand that this is a fun, exci exciting thing for the kids to do and explore themselves and the colors and what have you. But um, did, you, did you for a minute consider the, the, the options that my child had? So next time you give out an assignment like this and you expect my child to expect me to help my child with this during her homework time, take some time to consider how it impacts my child. What do you think? I think that's fair, and I think you made a really good point. Sometimes teachers do things, and there's not necessarily a malicious intent behind that. I think in that case, the teacher wasn't being sensitive or thoughtful in terms of the right. fact that there was at least one child in the class who, um, you know, would not be of the same, you know, background as the other students. And we find out a lot, and one of the reasons, and I think parents don't even realize this sometimes, most of the people who are coming through traditional educational programs there are no courses on, per se, cultural competency or culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally relevant curriculum. So a lot of what they're encountering in the classroom space is hands-on training for them. Oftentimes, school districts will have professional development that will help to reinforce, you know, new trends and best practices. But you do have a generation, if not multiple generations of teachers, that for some of them, they never expected to teach children of color. And as our populations are starting to grow, you you're finding that even in districts that historically were all white, there may be a small mass of students of color, but they're still there. So we have to make sure that we're holding teachers accountable. And I like the fact that you didn't just step back and say, oh, that was a horrible assignment, and how could she have done that? Instead, you realize that that was a moment to advocate on behalf of your daughter. And I would suspect that for that teacher, now she's conscious and aware that moving forward, that type of assignment may not be effective or the most appropriate one for that classroom. Right. Um, I wanted to also go back to where you talk about being knowledgeable and um, looking at how the school is rated and how the school has done in the past. Now, for most people, at least that was my experience, and most parents I know when their, school, when their kids are in the public school system, um, their kids are at a school that they don't choose. It just right. is based on where you live. So mm -hmm. I obviously think the option is if you're not satisfied with the education that your child is getting, consider at least supplementing it. I think that every, every child should have a supplemental curriculum, a homeschool curriculum, even if you keep them in the public school system. Um, and I think another option, which I obviously exercise, is to take them out and just take full responsibility for their education. But what are the other options? I mean, if it's the worst school and you live there and you don't have a choice, mm -hmm. What can you do? What are, what are a parent's options? 
This is where being knowledgeable is so important. Most states have what they call school choice or choice or vouchers. So people aren't as limited as they think they are. But this varies from state by state. So I can't give like this a wide sweeping generalization and say, well, this is applicable to everyone. But what I can say is go to your state's Department of Education, their website, um, some of them are not user friendly, so make sure you use the search option if you can't find it immediately. But find out if your state is a choice state, sometimes they'll say education reform, voucher. And what that really means is that basically you have other options besides your local traditional public school. Um, the other component of it is that parents, if let's say, for example, you're in a state where that's not an option and you have to send your child to that failing school, make sure that if it's possible that you're working with other parents. One the things I'm noticing is that um, parent teachers conference, not parent teachers, conference, parents teacher associations, PTOs, parent liaisons, those are being underutilized. You have a lot of schools where you don't have parents advocating. And so when policy is being made and decisions are being made and parents aren't brought to the table, then ultimately they're having to respond to the decisions that have been made as opposed to being participants in the decision making. So take advantage of going to school board meetings. School board meetings are public by law. They have to be listed ahead of time because people, you know, have to be given advance notice if they want to attend. You have a right to speak at those school board meetings. There was one recently um, that took place uh, in Detroit, which is my hometown, and uh, parents were outraged because here it is November, and there were still some students who have textbooks and who did not have full-time teachers. They were having subs. And so the local media caught wind of the story, and then they carried it, and so then it became kind of a national conversation. So even though those parents might have been thinking, well, I'm one and like, let's say, uh, three, 400,000 people, who's going to listen to me? You never know. So I think the critical component is that even if it seems like you're disempowered and even seems like you're in a hopeless situation, it's not as hopeless as you may think because you do have advocates and allies. And sometimes those people are behind the scenes. They're not necessarily in front, um, but they're, they're behind the scenes and they're paying attention. And they're groups that um, have started at a grassroots level for community members and parents who are really concerned about the state of our um, education system. Um, and I, I just want to point out a trend that's emerging in our conversation is every time that we talk about something or a possible problem, um, the solution is about a, is surrounded or at least um, the solution is a proactive parent or proactive yeah. parents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in every way. As you, much you as know. possible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, you know, when I was growing up, my parents assumed that the school was good and it was. And they really didn't have to do much except drop me off and then mm -hmm. ask me, did you do your homework? And then <laughs> they get the, the, the report card at the end of the, the school year or the term or whatever it is, semester, whatever we're calling it at the time. Um, they didn't have to do much. But what I'm right. recognizing now that's very, very different in this generation and probably is going to get even more that way in the future is that parents have to be extremely proactive um, and they have to have an attitude of I'm responsible for my children's education um, and if I don't stand up and advocate for them they could get lost in that system. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? I think that's fair and I think the thing that we have to remember is that education's changed. Um, my experience of education was very similar to yours. Like my parents, it didn't matter what I said, what my teacher said trumped what I said. There were a couple of occasions I would come home and I would be complaining. And my mother, you know, it wasn't like, oh, Tyra, those teachers are being so mean to you. It was like, okay, what did you do? Mm -hmm. You know, so the impetus for proving that something hadn't happened fell on me, not on the teacher. But I think the system's changed. I think there's been so much pressure for educators um, to uh, teach to the test. There's been such a push from outside forces, business entities, political, um, you know, people politically who are vested in education are now the ones who are making a lot of the policy. And so what's happened is that you have some really good, decent, hardworking teachers that are in the classroom who are working with children and working with parents. But unfortunately, what's happened is that you've had a couple of examples where, you know, um, systems have failed children. And those are the types of examples that help to remind us that at the end of the day, we have to hold um, our own children accountable. We also have to hold our schools accountable, but it is a totally different day in terms of education because it's not as grassroots as it used to be. Teachers often used to live in the communities that they taught in, right? So these students weren't just 
their students. They were their neighbors. They were their community members. Right. And so now you have the advent of a lot of teachers. Not only do they not live in those communities, they live very far away. They're very detached from the realities of their students. So it is already creating like this dichotomy of us and them. And I think some of that's playing out in the classroom space to the extent that a lot of students of color specifically don't feel as if they're being championed or they're being advocated for. And that's why I, I continuously make the argument that's where parents have to fill in the gap. You can't assume that some adult is going to do, in essence, what you may have to do to make sure that, that education system works for your child. Um, so I'm going to throw what I already know is a really tough question at you. Okay. But what if I say, look, you know, um, Dr. Salden, I hear you. You're saying mm -hmm. I should do more, mm -hmm. and you're saying right. education has changed. But I'm not, I'm not a single mom personally, but, you know, this mm -hmm. hypothetical person is. I'm a single mom, sure. and I have all these kids, and I have to mm -hmm. put food on the table. I have to work two jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just can't be at the school. But I want my kids to get a good education. What then? Okay, so here's the deal. Realistically, even if someone's coming from a two-parent environment, both parents are working, it's not always going to be feasible for someone to physically be there. There are other ways you can be present without physically being in a space, and that's where building those relationships come in handy. I always say that, you know, not only is it important to know who your, te your student's teachers are, but know who the secretaries are, know who the counselors are, know who the support staff people are. Um, if your child's in the special education department, who are the instructional aides? And the reason why I say that is because once you build those relationships, then you have another set of eyes and ears that are looking out for your child. And I think that's critical. It's not always about physically being somewhere, but it is about knowing that you have other people who are going to advocate for your child, who are going to be allies. And the most important way to establish that is by having relationships with people. So I hear that and I, I totally understand it. So I don't want to come across as being elitist or not being sensitive to the fact that we know that there are a lot of, especially women of color, who have to work who don't have, you know, time on their hands to be at all of these various meetings. But that doesn't mean that you still don't have a voice. And that's where I think collaborating with other parents is important, too, mm -hmm. because, you know, when you're in those organizations and when you're part of, you know, um, your PTOs or your, your parent liaisons, then there's someone else who can then speak on your behalf. Because chances are, if you're dealing with an issue, someone else's child is as well. Like, it's very yeah. rarely that's an anomaly, right? More than likely, if there's a teacher who's a bad teacher, that teacher's not just a bad teacher to your child. The teacher's a bad teacher, period. So you may not be the face of that, but someone else could be. And I think that's the critical component, that if you can't be there physically, are there other ways that you can make sure that your presence is felt? Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, and the last thing that I want to touch on is, um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the, school, the preschool to prison pipeline. Um, right. And can you... Um, you know, and I know some of these questions are a little tough, but can you can okay. you give me some indicators as a parent um, in terms of my child is in school, usually my little black boy, he's in school. Um, mm -hmm. What are the indicators that he's very vulnerable to that other than the fact, of course, that he's a little black boy in mm -hmm. again, I'm speaking from my own experience in a district mm -hmm. or a community where everybody doesn't look like him. What are the mm -hmm. indicators that. Um, he's vulnerable to falling into that um, into that trap. I would say pay attention to how uh, staff members talk about your child. Okay, and what I mean by that is that words carry a lot of power, and sometimes we, in a very subtle way, will tell someone how we really feel about their children. So if terms like aggressive, terms like uh, he's being disobedient or he's a behavior problem, or I can't control him, or he's um, creating, you know, a negative space in the class and is hurting other children. Those are all code words, because what's that signaling and saying is that your child's the problem. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to make sure you're asking questions like, okay, can you give me specific examples? What are some of the things that my child is doing? Because there's a difference between a child that's misbehaving and a child that's engaging in age-appropriate behavior that may be immature. And I think that's where it becomes a slippery slope that, you know, little kids, especially at that age, they're, they're very immature. Um, they're still developing. They're still learning right from wrong. And sometimes adults expect them to take on adult behaviors. And so what tends to happen, especially in instances where we really talk about the prison, I mean, preschool to prison pipeline, or some people say cr uh, cradle to um, 
prison pipeline is that those kids are being treated differently and unfairly and things that may be just oh excuses oh he's just being a child are seen as oh my gosh this child is a problem this child is violent this child is going to hurt someone so pay attention to that because that's critical also most preschools will send home those little behavior slips such and such was good today ate all of his food slept for about an hour whatever the case mm-hmm. may be so look at that because chances are that if you're starting to notice a pattern well he's consistently being reprimanded or he did this or he did that that's again another indicator that potentially the people who are taking care of your child this preschool see your child as a problem so what you don't want to have happen is for that third slip to come home and let's say that's their suspension suspension policy and it's all of a sudden like your child's been suspended for two days okay so chances are there were many indicators Indicators. leading up to that, that there was a problem. And I think that's where the preschool piece is critical, that you can, you know, and many times it's instinctual when you hear things and you know things and it sounds like it's loaded and it sounds like it may have a negative denotation. Chances are it does. And that's when you want to really, again, I can't emphasize this enough, be proactive about it because sit down, talk to that teacher. If you're in a position Go visit the school because when you're in the classroom space and you're sitting back, you're unobtrusive, you're just an observer, you can see an awful lot. Does that teacher call on your child? Is your child being ignored? Is your child being reprimanded more severely or more frequently than other students are? All of those are indicators that there may be a problem with the system and not so much a problem with your child. Now, conversely, if your child does have behavioral issues, because I see this a lot, you have to own that because it's not always the teacher's fault. It's not always the preschool's fault. So if you know your child is wreaking havoc in your home, you can't expect that child to turn it off and all the school go to school and he's an angel. So there has to be a level of honesty there as well in terms of who are you sending to that school right. and to what extent do you need to mitigate that behavior so that that child learns right from wrong and does not become labeled in such a way that it's going to carry him through the rest of his K through 12 experience. Right. Um, you know, Tyra, I actually have personal experience with that. I have two kids. I have a daughter and a son as different as night and day. My daughter, from the time she was very little, has always been overactive, opinionated. Um, and <laughs> in my day, they'd be like, oh, that girl acts like a boy because she runs, she <laughs> punches, just, you know, um, a very energetic child. And then I have a son who is more quiet and more laid back. Mm-hmm. And for me, the red flag came when the reports came from my son, who's the quiet one, um, or mm-hmm. at least he was at that time. He was three, four years old and was in preschool. And the reports were coming in, and it was those little slips at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And I noticed the word aggression kept coming up. Yeah. And I said, you know what? Mm-hmm. If a teacher wrote to me and said my daughter was aggressive, I'd have to look into that. Um, <laughs> but with my son, the one who's so sweet and soft and generous and you're saying aggression Mm. um Mm -hmm. that was a very big red flag um and it actually made me angry because it made me wonder Mm. what what's happening to him that a child Mm -hmm. who's normally so easygoing is now gone all the way to the other end of the spectrum where he's showing aggression Mm. that we never see and i did do Mm -hmm. exactly what you said tyra They said that he showed aggression a lot of times when they were at gym. So I said, tell me what time gym is, and I'll come, and I'll play during gym. And what I saw was he actually had other little boys in there who were doing stuff to him, throwing balls at him, Mm. hitting him. And when he would tell Mm. the teacher, the teacher would tell him to go away. So he Mm. did have where they were doing things to him until he got to a point where any normal human being, even adults, if you keep doing something to them, they have a limit and they will display some kind of aggression. Um, And it was easy for me, again, because I had um, the opportunity to go to the school. Um, And I won't revisit the conversation of not everybody can go and see what's going on. That's a a topic for another day. But Mm -hmm. I do want to thank you, Tyra. Um, Even myself being an educator, being a mom, having gone through the public school system, I, I really, really appreciate all the valuable information that you've shared with us. I hope we can do this again and uh, keep it as an ongoing conversation. Um, to our Your Black Women audience, I just want to tell you again, this is Dr. Tyra Selden. Um, she's an educator, um, she's a writer, and she's an editor at Your Black Education. Uh, a powerful message from her about what parents need to do to 
make sure that the kids are having a good educational um, experience and what they can do to make it better. Again, I'm No Malang, I'm Sally Moses. I am the founder of uh, the blog, uh, The Black Homeschool, and I am a full-time homeschooling mom and have been for three months. Uh, I'm sorry, for the last three years. So um, this is a, a subject that I'm very passionate about, and I want to thank you for listening. And to Tyra, I want to say thank you for joining us on this segment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time, guys.